Hello and welcome back to the Shiki Science Show. So today we'll be looking at the question, what makes the circadian clock tick? TTFL. So in the last video, I introduced you to the concept of the circadian clock and the circadian rhythm and what that's about and how it is important for coordinating different responses in the body. So check out that video, the link's in the description. But this video will address how the circadian clock operates molecularly and the key protein factors and genes that are involved in regulating this process. Now work on the discovery of some of these key factors by these three guys here, Jeffrey Hall, Michael Rosbach and Michael Young, led to them being awarded the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. So in the last video I gave you not a bad but brief introduction to the key components involved in coordinating this 24 hour cycle. So in this video, I hope to give you more insight into the, what these different factors are doing and how this process is operating. So because we are mammals, I will focus on the mammalian key components in this video. So the four key components to get to grips with is clock, BMAL1, cry or cryptochrome and pa or period. And just to add a bit to the complexity, you have cry1 and you have cry2 and there are three different copies of the period's protein. And so part of the protein's functions requires that clock and BMR1 interact with each other, and likewise, cry and pa interact with each other as well to carry out some of their functions. So what is their function? So the core circadian clock factors act to coordinate the TTFL, and so TTFL is the transcription translation feedback loop, and so this is the, the loop that regulates the 24 hour cycle in the circadian rhythm. It is what makes sure that the rhythm is around 24 hours and feedbacks on itself. And this is the negative feedback with delay that we spoke about in the last video. So how do these core components do this then? So let's start with clock and BMR1. So as I mentioned previously, clock and BMR1 form a dimer together and they are both transcription factors, so this means that they regulate the expression of different genes. So to perform their role, they need to be in the nucleus of the cell. And so interestingly, two of the genes that clock and BMR1 regulate the expression of are cryptochrome and period, and they promote the expression of these two genes. So in addition to those two, they regulate a whole plethora of other genes as well. But of interest to the negative feedback we're talking about here, cryptochrome and par of the most interest. So cry and par go into the cytosol to get translated into protein and it's their protein products that then go back into the nucleus and they act to repress the activity of clock and BMR1. So by repressing the activity of clock and BMR1, they effectively repress the promotion of their own gene expression. So if that made any sense, what's happening is that cry and pa are acting to prevent their own expression and this therefore reduces the level of protein in the cytosol. And so it is thought that the synthesis and then repression of synthesis is what coordinates the 24 hour timescale of the circadian clock. But this is just one loop of three main interconnected loops that help to coordinate and keep the robustness of this 24 hour cycle. So let's just briefly recap what we've covered so far. So that is, clock and BMR1 drive the expression of cryptochrome and periods. But in addition to cryptochrome and periods, they also drive the expression of rev, rub and raw. And so these two latter proteins are interconnected with the other loop because they act to regulate the expression of BMR1. So rev, rub acts to repress the expression of BMA1, whereas RAW activates it. And so the third loop considered to be most important for the regulation of the circadian clock is DBP, which is the D-box binding protein. And so DBP is interconnected because one of its binding proteins is regulated by the competition between rev -Urb and RAW. So rev -Urb and RAW control the expression of a protein that interacts with DBP, which is the third loop of this interconnected loop system that keeps a robust 24 hour roughly rhythm that is important for the circadian clock. But even with these complicating interconnected loops of the regulation of gene expression, this doesn't fully 
complete the understanding of how we get a robust 24-hour rhythm. In addition to synthesis, there's also protein degradation, which is also critical to the regulation and robustness of the circadian rhythm. So in particular, it seems that the degradation of the protein period and the protein cryptochrome is important for completing the 24-hour cycle. So cryptochrome gets degraded when it is first phosphorylated by AMPK, which is the kinase protein. And so this additional phosphate enables it to be recognised by FBXL3, which then triggers CRY for degradation. Similarly, period also gets phosphorylated, but this time by the protein CK1, Delta or Epsilon. And the additional phosphate enables it to be recognised by the beta TRCP protein, which then causes period to be degraded as well. So this protein degradation acts in addition to the repression of gene expression that we saw earlier to make sure that both period and cryptochrome levels decrease before they then increase during the next cycle of the circadian rhythm. So I've put a link to this paper here in the description for more information and more detailed information about the mammalian components involved in regulating the circadian clock. But hopefully this video has given you an overview into the different factors and how they cooperate and are interconnected and this creates a robust feedback mechanism to keep a 24-hour cycle.